For those of you who weren't here yesterday, I'm Dr. Glenn Caddy, and I'm the moderator. And uh, um, if you need any information about me, it's in the brochure. I'm not going to self-advertise, but if you need to talk to me about anything, then uh, during the breaks, I'm more than happy to make myself available. Um, the other uh, notice that I want to make sure that people know is that um, we are still searching for a substantial number of the responses to the questionnaire that we handed out yesterday. Um, I think we've only got about 17 that have been returned. So um, uh, everybody should have uh, one of the questionnaires in their packet. If you didn't bring your packet here today and you need a questionnaire in order to be able to return it to us, um, then please see me and we've got, we've got plenty uh, of questionnaires available. Um, just to explain, this, this is a, a questionnaire that has been designed uh, to gain some uh, data. Uh, it's part of a data collection study um, that uh, is being done by two of the, uh, two of the presenters here. Um, and the issue that they're looking for is sort of um, just general attitudinal uh, factual informational data dealing with your understanding or concepts or thoughts in regard to various issues around the parental alienation question. Okay? So um, we would very much appreciate it if you could take some time um, between breaks or uh, whenever you can and get these uh, into me before, before lunchtime, please. Um, all right. Our, um, our next uh, presenter is Dr. A. Warren Klein. And let me introduce uh, Dr. Warren Klein. He's going to be uh, talking about uh, cutting the suit to fit the alienated child, uh, as he's entitled it, and it's initializing the nature and modalities of intervention. Dr. Warren Klein is, uh, um, uh, he holds a PhD in clinical and, uh, and he's a clinical and forensic psychologist and he's in private practice in Montreal. Uh, he's a professor of Dawson College, but he wasn't able to open the door for us. <laughs> And, sorry, Abe, um, and a lecturer <laughs> at uh, Concordia University. In addition to his practice in clinical and forensic psychology and psychotherapy, Dr. Warren Klein is certified as a family mediator. Dr. Warren Klein has been declared an expert witness in Superior Court um, and in South Court uh, and in Youth Court, serving uh, several hundred times, primarily in Canada, but also in the United States and the Caribbean. Uh, some people pronounce it Caribbean. Um, and uh, he has, um, and he's presented on this topic uh, in numerous professional conferences in Canada and the United States, and also even in Europe. He's been quoted in significant judgments dealing with parental alienation and high conflict divorces. He's a member of the Canadian Register of Health, uh, Registry of um, Health Service Providers in Psychology, and has been certified by the Association of State and Provincial Psychology Boards. Dr. Warren Klein is on the committee to have the parental alienation uh, concept accepted into the DSM-5 uh, DSM and ICD-11, uh, and has spoken on many occasions on radio and regarding parental alienation and its effects on alienated children. He's also on the International Board of, uh, excuse me, the International Board of the American Journal of Family Therapy. So without further ado, Dr. Warren Klein. Thank you very much and good morning. Um, my topic today is basically, as Glenn said, cutting the suit to fit the child and dealing with factors that are important to consider for effective intervention of parental alienation. Um, kids today, unfortunately, are growing up too quickly, way too quickly, and that's also, that's true for children and that's, do, that's also true for what I call screenagers today. Um, the fact of the matter is that um, because they are so more, they are so aware of what is happening and they are so often involved in the divorce, we have huge problems because the kids are becoming, uh, are being forced to grow up quickly 
and they're being cheated out of their childhood. In fact, I do believe that parental alienation is probably the most serious form of emotional and psychological abuse. Um, the kids are growing up so quickly. I'm reminded, and I always like to tell uh, the story of the two five-year-olds, where one five-year-old tells the other one, you know, there was a big fight in my house the other day. And the other five-year-old says, really, what happened? And the first five-year-old says, well, my mother found a contraceptive on the veranda. And the other five-year-old says, really, what's a veranda? <laughs> but, be, but be that as it may, when we take a look at the issue of parental alienation, what we need to understand is that before we could actually intervene, we have to have knowledge of different factors that were present in the alienation. Just to go in and try to undo the alienation without knowing the themes of the alienation or the methods, uh, the way that they were programmed, the way that they were brainwashed, you may not be touching on the factors that we need to touch to basically show the child um, and have the child realize that there really is no grounds for the rejection. Now, if we take a look at factors, Claywar and Rivlin point out that we need to have an understanding of each of these factors. Knowledge of the themes and the content used, knowledge of the techniques, used to transmit the themes, knowledge of the duration and intensity, extremely important, knowledge of the motives of the alienator, and we'll touch on that in a little while, establishment of rapport with the child, which is an absolute must, probably the first thing that needs to be done, especially when we consider that often the alienating parent discourages the child from becoming involved in therapy. So, for example, I know of a situation, and I'm going to change some of the actual facts, where basically a child has been told, you know, you don't need to go to see Warren Klein. There's no need for it. Nobody could force you to go. And you know what? He's going to confuse you even more. You know the situation, and therefore you do what you feel is right, further empowering the child to reject the other parent. Knowledge of potential risks with implementation. Please understand, you know, just intervening and reuniting, there are some risks. We have to consider what are the possible effects, not just the positive effects, but some of the negative effects that the, ch the child could be affected with. Changing the schedule of the time that the child has contact with the other parent re-education, counseling, and therapy. Now, when we talk about therapy, I, I happen to love this cartoon. <laughs> Two kids talking, my mom has a new boyfriend, my dad has a new girlfriend, and all I got was a new therapist. <laughs> the fact of the matter is that we have to consider that there are different reasons that the therapist, the well, therapist needs to consider why a child may resist visitation. And we're going to get into the differences between estrangement, alienation, and denial of visitation. But basically, we have to understand that sometimes the reasons that the child refuses to be with a parent is realistic. Developmentally, you know, you have to consider the child's development, and you also have to basically, there may be a resistance to the parent's parenting style, rigidity, anger and sensitivity. Kelly and Johnston furthermore point there may be resistance arising from the child's concerns about an emotionally fragile. I, I want to tell you something. I am finding this happening a lot. We'll get into the issue of parentification. Um, there was recently an article, an excellent article, if you haven't seen it you should take a look at it, in the American Journal of Family Therapy by Berger who talks about parentification, adultification, and infantilization. And what I'm finding a lot with kids is that the child feels responsible for
for the alienating parents' well-being, for the emotional well-being. And they feel that unless they basically take care of the parent, and one of the ways to take care of that parent is by you know, going with the parent, doing what the parent wants, staying with the parent, not having any contact with the other parent. And we'll, talk, we'll, talk, we'll touch upon that a little bit later. And again, there may be a resistance, as we'll see a little bit later in terms of the risk factors, from the remarriage of a pattern. And I might add that often a child is alienated from a I'm sorry, a child refuses to be with a parent for absolutely valid reasons, in which case it's not considered alienation. And we'll get to that. Um, let's take a look at it. Alienation versus estrangement versus denial of access or time. Again, when there's alienation, we're talking about a child that had a good relationship with a parent. However, there were unreasonable ideas placed in the child's mind. There were unjustified reasons. And the child has been led to believe, and we'll see how it's done, directly or indirectly by the alienating parent, that that person should not be associated with. That parent is dangerous. The estranged child resists or refuses contact for, uh, for OK, I'm sorry. In the estrangement factor, we have something totally different. The estranged child has legitimate reasons not to want to go with that parent. So when a child, for example, tells me that my father or my mother is always smoking up, he's always in outer space, he's always sleeping, he doesn't, he doesn't want to do anything with us, he's extremely harsh with us, he physically disciplines us. When they give a realistic, justifiable reason, and it's really, I mean, everything is justifiable and verifiable, it's not called alienation. It's called estrangement. And I will tell you in that situation, it's not that there's an, the alienating parent, the alienating parent in that situation is the one that smokes up speaks negatively constantly about the other parent, threatens the kid, has a very, very poor parenting style. It's that parent, the one that the child is refusing to see, that is alienating the child from him or herself. Now, here's a situation of alienation. The mother says, or, well, I guess it's the mother, yeah. I put them up after the divorce so he knows his father is still a part of his life. <laughs> and the parent may say, yes, it's a cartoon. The parent may say, well, hey, I want to have a picture of the father in the room. Well, hello, you're being a little bit selective in the pictures that you choose. In denied visitation, when there's a court order to that effect, the denial is the result of concerns because of the history of violence or abuse, substance abuse, threats to the child's safety, poor su supervision. And according to Stolberg, um, this occurs in approximately 20 to 37% of divorces. Now, again, in almost all of these cases, I would even say, I mean, all of them, there is a tremendous amount of parental conflict. And it's therefore difficult to determine the impact of the other parents being refused access from the effects of the parental conflict, because often the parental conflict escalates even more as a result of the child's refusal, adamant refusal, to go with the other parent. Now, this is interesting. Um, if we take a look at, I, I know that there are um, certain groups that basically say that you know, parental alienation is, you know, doesn't exist, it's fabricated, there's no reality, there's no substance. And um, a lot of the groups basically say because um, it's always, I mean, people who maintain that it's parental alienation, they maintain that it's, it's, the, it's more the, significantly more the mother that does the alienation. And Claywar and Rivlin actually give 13 reasons why in the 70s and 80s it was predominantly more. However, what we need to take into account 
is that more recent research shows that that tremendous discrepancy between males and females do not exist to that extent. And we, today we are finding, and I am finding, some of the first judgments, some of the first cases where parental alienation were discussed in Quebec involved basically a father um, who was alienating, uh, I'm thinking of two of them in particular, one of them by Judge Gomery, um, was basically a father who was doing the alienation. And in fact, the parent, the alienated parent right now in that famous um, case of Judge Gomery is running a deprogramming institute in Texas. That was the basis of uh, Judge Gomery's um, judgment. Um, getting back to Garber, which I mentioned, there are a lot of hybrid conditions, according to Garber, that can lead a child to becoming alienated. Now, it could be the child's exposure to the child being put, to the parent, the target parent being put, the alienating, putting down the target parent. It could also be the child's direct experience. But I am also going to tell you that what we need to take into account is that parentification, which is a form of emotional abuse, where there's a role reversal that the child feels that he or she has to take care of the parent, makes the child feel responsible for the parent, makes the child feel concerned that if I'm not living with that parent, that parent emotional health is going to deteriorate. And that we are seeing, um, and that's why he calls it a hybrid condition, because while there may be alienation as well, there's often a situation of parentification. We also have a situation called adultification, Garber's words. In adultification, you have the child is treated by the parent as a peer, as an adult. So, you know, hello, you know, do you think I should go out with Bob? You think I should go out with Alice? What do you think we should do? What do you think I should do? Mom, I'm six years old. What are you asking me for? Where the child is basically treating like an equal. The child is not an equal. The child has needs that are very, very different than the parent, and that has to be respected. The child's childhood should be respected. So again, we need to take, be aware, uh, according to Rohrbach, um, some of the risk factors, and I, it's not just according to her, but it's very obvious, there are certain risk factors that potentiate a child to become alienated. Now, when we take a look at the, the risk factors, there, there are quite a few of them. In one case, the child is caught in the middle of a high-conflict divorce. And that's extremely important because very often the child doesn't know which way to go. At times, for example, the child will go and will align him or herself with the parent that he feels more insecure. In other words, and I, I, I've seen this and I've heard this, I don't have to go with my father because no matter what, he will always be there for me, or mother for that matter. When I say one, it could be the other as well. He's always going to be there for me. I'm afraid that if I don't agree with my mother, basically she's going to get remarried, she's going to have other kids, and that's going to be the end of my relationship with her. The school-aged child is often asked to take sides. And infant, inf the infant and toddler, for example, who basically um, have great difficulty in making head or, heads or tails, often feels caught. And that's why they can't win. If I say this, it's no good. If I say this, it may be no good. Which way do I go? A, a second factor under this is ongoing conflict post-separation. Ongoing legal proceedings is a, is a huge one here. The fact that they're ongoing, the parent experiences a lot of you know, shame, humiliation, anger, and what we take what happens as a result is that the parent often blurs the boundaries between the parent and the child. 
And often th that happens when there's um, traumatic proceedings that happened before. In other words, when the separation is traumatic um, and the parent is not emotionally prepared for it, they're in shock when there is the issue of separation coming up, we often find that to take place. There are also cross allegations of abuse, poor parental capacity in terms of the ongoing post-separation conflict. We also have factors due to the aligned parent. And this we see a lot with older children and teenagers. Very often the aligned parent, um, I'm sorry, the alienating parent, I apologize. Uh, well, the aligned parent, the same thing. The, the aligned parent is more permissive. They're allowed to do what they want. There's no curfew. I won't minimize the time that you have on the computer. I won't minimize this, I won't minimize this. For a lot of kids, hey, this is, you know, uh, paradise. This is wonderful. And again, they may do it specifically because they know that the other parent basically has strict guidelines, firm guidelines, and that they insist. Again, you have the alienating parent, and this is common. The alienating parent experiences separation as complete abandonment. And they see they are afraid that they are going to be abandoned, and I might add, often again, because this may have been something that happened in their childhood based on histories that, at least, uh, that I have for many alienating parents. Um, and of course, the alienating parent, as we'll see shortly, is involved in ongoing programming and brainwashing of the child, which to me is extremely important. The third group of factors is the target parent. And again, as I said earlier, History of abusive behavior is a very big risk a factor. Authoritarian um, parenting style, personality. Fourth one is extremely important, lack of validation or empathy. And kids often will report that. And lack of financial ability to oppose the alienating parent behaviors. And that's a very big factor as well. And again, sometimes when I meet with a child who is alienated, they often come up with a statement that, um, that in fact, when I speak to my father or my mother, as the case may be, they don't care about what I have to say and they don't validate. Just do this, just do that, without really empathizing with the child. The child factors. Developmental stage of the child is extremely important. If we take a look at the cognitive development of a child, children at certain ages are not able to entertain inconsistent beliefs, inconsistent views. And consequently, what they do is that they often will side with one parent so that they're not, they're not stuck in the conflict from a developmental point of view. If we take a look at some children, there's an issue of poor psychological adjustment. And again, they may feel abandoned by a parent. They may be confused for the reason why what's going on is going on. And the psychological adjustment may lead the child to make a poor choice and just side with the parent that promises them the sun and the moon. Parent-child relationship factors. Extreme dependency on the aligned parent, and again, some parents will specifically encourage, promote, foster a complete dependency on that parent to the point that this alienating parent ensures that the child feels that they cannot live, continue, exist without this particular parent. Threats, and I've seen these, I've heard these, to leave or not have a relationship with the child. As we'll see shortly, the, the love of the alienating parent is conditional. And very often, the alienating parent tells the child that if you don't do this, 
Just to give you an example uh, that I heard from a kid that told it to me, I'm going to get remarried. I'm going to have other children. And they're going to be my only children. Now, imagine the impact on the child. And then there's the past history of limited or no contact with the target parent or his family, which again is going to be a risk factor. It's interesting, when we take a look at this issue with one of Gardner's eight, eight symptoms, um, that there's generalization to the extended family. Um, but there's a file that, I, I, I mean, there's a situation where it's, um, it's quite amazing that the alienating parent continued writing with the extent to writing to the extended family emails, signing it the names of the children when the children had no conception of it in order to eliminate that quote unquote symptom. Quite interesting. So that when the children were asked, actually it was one girl, when the girl was asked, you know, how about getting, you know, when was the last time that you saw your grandparents? I, I haven't seen them in a long time. And um, what about writing to them? Um, I haven't written to them in a long time. And how do you feel about seeing them? Well, I don't know. I haven't seen them for a long time. And basically, when I spoke to the grandparents, they said, what are you talking about? We're getting emails. The thing that struck me was that the emails were impeccably, the words, the spelling was impeccable. And basically, for a child of that age, I, I wouldn't have expected it or some of the terminology. And again, as I said, parent-child relationships. Please understand the parentification, which I explained, adultification, which I explained, infantilization. When the child is made, to, and I, I did explain it as well, to make totally, totally depend, to be totally dependent upon the parent, the child feels basically at a loss to get together with the other parent because, hey, I need my mother, I need my father because they've been made to feel so dependent upon them. And this is a big one as well. Another set of risk factors are factors due to new relationships. Um, the new partner of the ta target parent, and this I think we all see a lot, the new partner of the target parent becomes the focus of the left behind parent. The child may also feel betrayed. My dad, my mom remarried or is living together with this person and this person is a lot more important than me. Or this person is a lot more important than the family was. And that is being reinforced by the alienating parent. That happens extremely, um, I find it a lot. In fact, one of the things that I always ask, uh, I don't want to say always, but very, very often ask, is I ask uh, to get a copy, once I get permission to speak to the school, to get collateral sources from the school, collateral information, I ask for a copy of the emergency sheet. I want to see who are the numbers, who are the names of the people that are listed on that emergency sheet. And often, in alienation, the biological parent is not there, but basically the new partner is there in place of the biological parent. That I see very, very often. And the new partner of the alienating parent may play a role because they may create jealousy in the child and they may create anger. Why couldn't you be like this with mom or with dad? And it creates problems on, on that sense. And again, new relationships intensify feelings of abandonment, which ha happens quite, quite frequently because if dad left mom, you know, what would happen, and dad found somebody else, what would happen if dad would, would leave me as well? So the child is, je is jealous, and um, I guess it intensifies the child's feelings of abandonment by the rejected parent. Now, again, the feelings of abandonment, and again, this is a very big one that has to be addressed, is that the child st sees the step-siblings as being competi competitors or, yeah, com um, competitors 
or competition. So you have to consider, it's not just the mother and the father that have to be considered. It's the child, it's the new relationships, it's the history of it, and last but not least, you have to take into account environmental factors. Now, we, I was in court um, a week ago, and the judge asked, what do I think would be helpful? There were kids that were alienated, what would be helpful? And I gave a list of things that I felt would be, you know, helpful, intensive intervention, you know, whatever, a whole list. And one of the things that I told the judge is that I really believe, and I think that it's a message that we need to take. In high conflict family cases, you need to have a judge seized with the file. Because those of you that have been in court know how many times there's an interim judgment, another interim, you know, um, again, it goes on and on, but often it's with different judges. And a judge needs to have a handle. These files are not easy. The files are voluminous. There are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages. To expect a judge to reread, you know, the whole file, and then another judge, again, the whole file. I mean, I imagine that those of us here that have dealt in terms of doing evaluations and are getting basically the proceedings, affidavits, judgments, um, all the other, you know, uh, depositions, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, I have files that I've received that are um, three, what do they call them? Three, four banker boxes. Some of them are immense. It just does not make sense. A judge who is seized with the file has a sense of the file. Also, I think it's helpful for the two parents to know that, oh my gosh, what if they don't know the whole file? What if they make you know, a judgment too quickly? But I really believe there needs to be continuity. Continuity in terms of the professionals involved, unless there are other reasons that negate that, but most importantly, judicial continuity. The judge really needs to be seized with the file. And again, I think that um, after a judgment is often given, there's often conflict between the two attorneys. What was the meaning of the judgment? And again, clear, enforceable orders have to be made where there are no questions, where it's black and white, even if there's a graph or a calendar included. I also believe that in most cases, at least initially, transitions should not involve face-to-face -face contact between the parents. My experience is, initially I'm talking about, my experience is that kids are absolutely petrified that the, that the parents are gonna go at each other and there's gonna be more conflict. So even though there may be a transition, there may be access for the child who has been alienated, what may hold it back is the fear that there's going to be a high conflict. Okay, now again, God, time's flying. Um, you can't treat the measles with makeup. That's a fact. You gotta get underneath it. You have to know what the child, uh, I don't know how that happened, what the child and the parents believe, feel, know, value, expect, and fear about the target parent. Very, let me give you an example. I don't want to see my father in this particular case. I'm afraid of him. What are you afraid of? Um, could you tell me what you're afraid of? And the child says, I don't really remember because it was so long ago. But the kid continues, I don't want. And when I saw the child with the father, the kid asked, could I sit next to you? And there was no active memory of what the child remembered. It's what the child heard. I will state, and I state it later, is that siblings, you, when you deal with an alienated children, you have to be very cautious in the therapy because often one child has an incredible influence on the other. So very often there's one that's a gatekeeper, one that's supervising, that the, uh, if you see them together, who will make sure that the other child 
says what he is, quote unquote, supposed to say. You got to be very, very cautious with that. And therefore, you know, yes, I will want to see them together, but that's just to get the dynamic. But they have to be dealt with. Interventions need to be done separately. Um, and again, you need to find out where the kid's inner mind is. If we take a look at the number of themes, it could be quite large. I believe Claywar and Rivlin cite 25 themes that parents use in terms of alienating the child. And I will also suggest that individuals that do um, evaluations need to consider what are these themes and also to ask questions based on the themes. So if a theme, let's say, and that's in the intervention and the evaluation. So for example, if the theme is the child is being restricted from loving both parents, which I think is the first one of Claire Rivlin, what would be a good question for the therapist or for the judge or for the evaluator to ask, is there anything that you are really afraid of that could happen because of the divorce? Do you feel free in your heart to love both of your parents? And sometimes questions like that just lead to a tremendous amount of material. Let's say um, inappropriate, unnecessary information was given to the child. Asking the child, you seemed very angry when you mentioned mom. Do you know why you feel angry at her? Is mom, is dad angry about something special that you know about it? Anyway, so you have to tailor the questions based on the different themes that you have found. So let's take a look at it a little bit further. It is important for the clinician to itemize and detail the themes that were used to alienate the child and that continue to preoccupy the child. It's not enough to know this kid does not want to see the mother. This kid is refusing to see the father. You've got to know what were the modalities that were used to get the kid to this point. Because otherwise, as I said earlier, you, tr you may be dealing, treating the measles with makeup without getting to the root of it and showing the child that these reasons that the child is giving are unjustifiable. And again, you got to be very careful, at least, well, you, you do have to be careful not to give this child a sense that you question the child's credibility or whether the child is telling the truth. Because that child, very quickly, early on in the process, may say, aha, uh -huh, you're with my dad, aha, uh -huh, you're with my mom. And that's important. One thing that I would also strongly recommend is that um, the therapy, I don't care what percentage, really does need to be paid by both parents so that the child is not left and the child cannot be told that basically, well, what do you think? It's your mom's therapist, it's your dad's therapist. It should be, even if it's, in, you know, financially, it, you know, it, even if it's, you know, 25, 75 or 80, 20 or whatever it may be, I think that that's important because I hear that often. You know, well, I had a kid a couple of weeks ago that told me, well, you're my father's expert, aren't you? And again, you know, um, and then the, I said, well, what does that mean? And I always ask that question. What does that mean? I don't take anything for granted. I, I, and an example that I, I, I've said previously, and I'll say it again, you have a kid, you know, that says, I want, I, I don't want joint custody. I don't want joint custody. And this is a kid that's eight years old. And I asked the child, because, you know, sometimes, you know, um, my facility with language is very poor, and I don't remember what these terms mean. I said, could you please tell me what joint custody is? I'm not sure what you mean. So the kid says, you know. And I said, I think I know, but I want to make sure what I know is what you know. I want to make sure it's the same thing. It's joint custody. Well, what does that mean? So he said, joint custody, the usual joint custody. <laughs> and finally, I said, look, you know what? It, it's very hard. You know, I'm not going to push the point, but I really, uh, it would be very helpful to, you know, you're telling me what you don't want, and I want to understand what you don't want, but you got to tell me what you don't want. So the kid, you know, uh, sighs and tells me, 
Well, if you don't know what joint custody is, you really shouldn't be doing this work. <laughs> the kid really did not know. The kid did not know. And you know what, sometimes when I do these alienation cases, and some of them, as I, I believe that you heard yesterday, are prone to going you know, to the Sendik's office, to the complaint department, you know, the licensing body, I say, maybe the kid's right, maybe I shouldn't be doing this kind of work. But you know what, the long run, you know that you're helping this kid and you're helping prevent a child you know, from uh, losing his childhood, from being cheated out of the childhood. Okay, now, um, I, I, again, you know, here, here's a comment that I found you know, in Clay Warren Rivlin, excellent book, by the way. Um, are there any positive things that your father, mother did? You know, a question like that may give a child a sense, they believe, uh, to the alienated child that he is talking to the enemy. And again, you, you really need to wait until the child finishes listing all the negative qualities. And um, uh, it, it's quite interesting because I got one child's negative, you know, negative qualities of her father, this is going back years ago, um, Father, the child was, it was um, an early adolescent, um, was sending the father emails. The most vulgar, vulgar emails imaginable. I mean, all the choice words of the lexicon the child seemed to know. And it was, you know, on and on and on. And the father showed me the email. I happened to know, because I did speak to the school, that the child was dyslexic. And, you know, um, the kid had an IEP, and the, you know, they, and the kid was very poor in the child's reading and spelling. Anyway, uh, when I meet with the child, you know, I had the thing in front of me, and I said, you know, I, I did get, you know, I don't want to hide anything from you, I did get a copy of the email that you sent your father. And um, the one thing that, you know, that, that I found, you know, well, you know, the language, I guess, leaves a little bit to be desired. But the question that I have is that the spelling was really, really good. And I know that you have some difficulty with spelling. And the child says, yeah, but my mother corrected it. <laughs> now, again, understand, and I might add, and this is interesting, I might add that um, a couple of days after I produced a report, I mean, there were tons, it wasn't the only thing, there were the child, the, the two children, this one in particular was, definitely alienated, and I wrote the report, and then a couple of days later, I get a phone call from the mother. So I said to myself, okay, here it comes. Um, the mother called me to thank me. After I recovered, I, I caught my breath. After I passed out and after I came back to, um, the mother said, and she apologized, she said, I didn't realize what I was doing. Now, whether that was because of the report, whether that was because it was going to go to court, I don't know. She seemed somewhat sincere. They did settle the case out of court. A father did get um, primary custody. The children were predominantly with father and gradually with therapy the kids were going to spend, hopefully, depending on what happens in the therapy, uh, an equal amount of time with mother. But in any case, um, let's just go on. Uh, these are very important questions to take into account when you work with a child who has been alienated. Does, number one, does the parent, the alienating parent, really believe what they are saying to the child. Are they saying it, they don't believe it for one second, but they're saying it just to turn the kid against the other parent. In some cases, they do not believe it. Their goal is one, get the kid. Get the kid away from the mother, get the kid away from the father. Obviously, if the parent really believes it, you may be dealing with different problems in the parent. I mean, I find that some parents that believe it have significant personality disorders, 
And again, you have to check out the reality testing um, of the parent, especially when you have concrete evidence that this, in fact, is not correct. Ulterior motives. What, are the alienating, and this comes up often, in cases of relocation. Is the purpose of the alienation to make relocation easier or more difficult? So for example, will a parent alienate the children from the parent, it could be both ways, who wants to move? Or is the parent alienating the children from the parent that wants to stay? So again, it is an important factor. Um, you have to take a look at the parental history. Uh, you have to take a look at the family history. Is there a history of rejection? Um, very often we find that alienating parents are very concerned about being abandoned by their children. And often when you take a look deep down there is a history of abandonment or fear of abandonment in their childhood. Parental personality. Is there a family or personal history of rejection? Is there a history of difficulty in clear thinking, which I guess ties up with the first one? Does the alienating parent have symptoms of a personality disorder? One thing, by the way, that I've used, um, one thing that I've used recently with doing evaluations is I do consider um, borderline personality disorder, um, especially when it deals with issues of uh, abandonment. And um, I mean, in some cases there is, and in some cases there's not. But it's something to be considered, especially when I have a feeling that there is alienation. So let's take a look at the themes that you have to recognize. I'm not going to spend two hours on this, because uh, they'll throw me off. Um, let's take a look at some of the themes that are used in terms of um, alienation. Never talking, denial of existence. When one, the alienating parent makes believe, and again, this is us, a lot of this stuff is in Claywar and Rivlin. When the, uh, the alienating parent refuses to talk about the other parent, and not only refuses to talk about the other parent, when the other parent says something, well, I'm sorry, when the child says something about the other parent, they often change the topic. They often say, you know, in some cases, we don't talk about her here. We don't talk about him here. And um, in one case recently, the kids, not denial of existence, it's denial of the role of the parent. All of a sudden, mom and dad is not mom and dad, or mom or dad, I should say. Often, if it was dad, or now all of a sudden it's, well, I want to go with, you know, I, I don't want to go with John. I don't like being with John. That parental role, this happens very often, that parental role is extricated. It's no more, you, we don't call them, and I might add, and I've seen it, the alienating parent in together with the child will refer to the dad in that case as John, not dad. It takes away, it denies the existence of father. John is like Joe, is like Abe, like Richard, like anybody. The denial of existence. Body language. You know what I did when I was with dad? There's no interest. The body language of the alienating parent um, shows that there's no interest about that other parent. And when the other parent is there and the child, the body language is extremely important to watch, to observe. It's because often you get messages in terms of how the child is exposed to the father and how the, ch the other parent is presented. This one is not an uncommon thing. I had a, a, a parent giving me uh, the book, the photograph. 
One thing that often parents will take in the context of a divorce is the family album, the pictures. And in that particular album, I saw the picture of the mother, and I'm changing mother, father, I'm not, you know. Um, anyway, of one of the parents, it was removed. The head was cut out. Similar to that first cartoon, where the only pictures the child has of the alienated parent are parents which basically uh, portray a negative meaning, a negative uh, feeling. Not allowing the child to have a picture of the other parent in the room. It's important to have a pi allow the child, if that's what the child wants, and I would even encourage it. Because what we tell kids when parents divorce is you're always going to have your mom and your dad. We're not going to live together. But the behavior is sometimes diametrically opposed to that. So yes, not allowing the child to have a picture. Not relaying messages or giving letters or presents. How often those of us that do evaluations and interventions see that you know, the birthday card was never received by the child. The birthday present was never received. And again, what is the message to the child? Well, I guess he forgot about us. I guess he doesn't remember us. I guess he doesn't care about us. Not acknowledging the presence of the other parent at school events or sporting events. Okay, in high conflict situations, I, I know that that happens often. But again, it's not just not only acknowledging. It's basically one parent getting upset when the other one came to watch the championship match in, uh, or one of the finals in soccer or something to that effect. Reinterpreting positive events into negative events. And parents do that. Alienating parents do that. Well, yeah, you know why your, your mom came? Because there was a big crowd. Everybody had to see your mom. That was the reason she came. When was the last time she came? And again, I think I mentioned sidetracking a child from discussing positive interactions by interrupting the child, changing the topic. Father didn't come to parent-teacher's meeting. Hello? Dad, you didn't come to parent-teacher's meeting. You never came. Nobody told me. Which, by the way, is a poor excuse. Because the parent should go to the school and have things sent to the parent as well. But again, not giving the child messages, you know, that there's certain events, that there's a soccer match, that there's this, that there's that, is a way of denying the existence. Hey, he doesn't care about you. He's not here. Um, a lot of kids do not want both parents there because they're afraid of a conflict as well. And I, I thought I would mention that. Okay, let's go on. Indirect attacks. So often attacks at the extended family. That needs to be looked at. And by the way, I do find that in some cases of alienation and uh, reuniting or reintegration or normalizing, whatever you'd like to call it, um, please understand, often the way to deal with the initial contact may also be with extended family, where they may be not as bad memories as of the direct family. You know, talking negatively about the career, talking negatively about activities that they do, associates, discussing issues, you know, putting the kid in the middle. Do you want to spend more time with me? Hey, don't ask the kid. Go ask the other parent before you ask the kid. What happens? Do I want it? You want to spend? Yeah, I want to spend more time. Well, your mother didn't let. Your father didn't let. You don't do that. It would be great if you could spend more time with me. How would you feel if I were to move? How would you feel if I were to change schools? Again, these are issues that need to be discussed with the other parent. Because you don't know what the other parent is going to say and it presents the other parent in a negative way. The, the conflict of loyalty is extremely important, uh, and some of these statements may seem so innocent, like vacation would have been so much more fun had we had more time together. And some kids will interpret it, yeah, but your father didn't let, or your mother didn't let. I don't know what's wrong with him. Um, often mother and father are talking together. The kid is there. All of a sudden, something is said, and then the parent loses it and says, I just don't know what's the matter with her. 
I just don't know. I don't know what's wrong with him. I don't know what's wrong with her. In the presence of the child, that happens often. Uh, the alienating parent makes a comment on the inability of the parent to control. This is what I've been living with. Always, he can't control, she can't control. She always makes comments. Understand if the, you need to know whether the child was exposed. Not just that, yes, the child was alienated. You need to know how was the child alienated. Um, and again, as I said, this is one of the reasons why kids often don't want their parents together. And again, the ally syndrome, where the child, basic, where the child or the parent, I should say, tries to get the child to align themselves with or against the other parent. What do you think, and I often hear this, what do you think we should do? Do you think it is fair for your father to want to have? What would you do if you were me? Do you think we should ask, we should ask for sole custody? And again, if you don't know what sole custody is, you shouldn't be doing this kind of work. Do you see what I've had to live with for the past 10 years? So again, that's the ally syndrome. Morality. Here's a case that I had up north. A kid was told by the mother, your father is the son of Satan. And I know I've said this previously. I asked the kid, how did that make you feel? The child said to me, terrible. And I said, can you tell me why? Because if he was the son of Satan, I'm the grandson. Um, morality symptom, uh, uh, syndrome rather. We don't, we don't believe in cheating the government out of taxes. I'm sure none of you do either. I've always taught you that one needs to be married before they live together with somebody like your dad. I want you to have a good relationship with your father, but I have a problem with, and again, something having to do with morality. Here's a case that I had, one of the first cases that I had of alienation where uh, a kid told me that the father said to him, your mother gave every guy on the block a particular type of job. When the father himself was running a pornographic uh, business, uh, pornographic, well, whatever. I will tell you some of the most difficult cases I've had in alienation are cases when there's a conflict of religion. And I'm not talking about two different religions. I'm talking, even if it's the same religion, where, where one parent is extremely observant and one parent is extremely non-observant, or two different religions. Um, just to give you an example, and I, I have to be cautious to change some of the things, when you have, let's say, a parent who does not believe in video games, TVs, from a religious point of view, video games, TVs, um, television, um, and the kids are going to a school, they have friends. When they go to one parent, the child is exposed to umpteen televisions, video games. When they go to the other one, the child is not. Uh, when the child, for example, I'll give you another example. You know, I, I mentioned earlier that you have to take a look at the alienating parent's motivation. And often in these cases, I find, religious cases, it may be because that's what the parent believes and they feel that it's wrong for the child, it's not good. In other cases, it's a question of vindictiveness. And I've seen that. And I've seen a situation where a kid, for example, was um, not supposed to travel in a car on Saturday. Well, that's when the child was with the mother. With the father, they were able to do whatever they wanted. The father picks up the kids on a Saturday. He takes them to his car. It's not a question of the traveling. The, guy, the father had the kids get into the car and they drove up and down the kids' neighborhood. Now this blows my mind, because what was the purpose of it? You know, what was, the, what, 
Why was that done? You know, if the person did not believe and he believed that, you know, that it was okay, that's one reason. But if this individual did it, and by the way, I, I didn't tell you one part of that, the child told me, the boy told me, that what he did, he was sitting in the back seat. He just got onto the floor of the car. The, the role of religion in some PAS situations, the parents believe that what they're doing is 100% right. The child should not spend time with that other parent. Again, the morality syndrome. I'm sorry? At 20 minutes? I'm joking. I'll, I'll, I'll finish up. I'll finish up. So again, um, you know, what you need to take into account, a threat, I'll, I'll go through this quickly, the threat of withdrawal of love. I mentioned this to you, if you do not say that you want to live with me, I will get remarried, have other children, they will. Has the child been told anything resembling that? Which would explain why the child would want to be with the alienating parent. Uh, children can be manipulated to fear a parent, uh, that a parent will reject them if they express their love or desire. I'm just going to go through this. The rejected parent does not and has not, never loved or cared about the, parent, about the child is what the child is made to feel, and that the child does not need the other parent in their life. The child is made to feel that the rejected parent is dangerous. Let me give you a couple of examples, recent ones. Five minutes? Okay. Um, this was a very tough one. It, it did not work out well. It did not work out well. Um, father takes the kids. I believe uh, Amcal had been involved in that file. Uh, father takes the kids and takes them to the mall. Um, the, played ball with the kids. The kid took the ball and threw it right at the father's face. The father offers the girl, would you like an ice cream? Yes, I would actually. When they came to pay, the girl takes out money. And no, 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 I'm going to pay. I said, well, where do you have the money for? I, I'd love to pay for you. No, I pay for myself. And what else do you have money for? I also have change in case something goes wrong, I should call 911. So again, you know, these parents, I'm going to, um, the target parent needs to understand that it is necessary for the child to have the truth and to not allow the alienating parent free reign to play with the child's head and perceptions of reality. Um, the target parent should be encouraged to protect their own relationship. We always tell, you know, where's the point of no return? Well, that has to be considered. But I will tell you, um, I know of situations where the, the, ch the parent said, you know what, I'm going to wait for the kid to come back to me. And later on, the, the child said to, the par to one particular parent, well, if you couldn't deal with mom, how did you expect I can? You shouldn't have left me. Um, okay. Oh, yeah. I, I, this is the point that I wanted to get. Amy... Baker pointed out, she's done some wonderful, wonderful work, that the strategies used by the alienating parent resembles the message that cult leaders, I don't know if that was that covered yesterday? Um, not really. Okay, that cult leaders convey to cult members. She believes that the strategies work together, and this is very important, the following three-part message. The alienating parent gives the child the message that they are the only parent who cares. That if your mother or your father would have cared, they would not have done this or that. Take a look at what they did. The child is left in umpteen ways. The message, the alienating parent is the only parent that cares. The second message is the alienating parent is needed in order for the child to feel safe and good about him or herself. It's only me that could take. I was the one that was always there. The other parent was never there. 
I'm the one that takes you to the doctor. I'm the one that, and you can't, more or less the message that the child will not do well unless they are with that parent. And here we go. The target parent who is dangerous and does not love the child anyway must be disallowed in order to maintain the love and approval of the alienating child. Now, I will add one thing. The love of the alienating parent. Now, again, remember what we talked about earlier. Sometimes the alienating parent does believe what they're doing, in which case you have to look at it deeper in terms of evaluating that individual. But the alienating parent's love of the child is often conditional. And if the, par if the child does what that parent wants, that child will be given a lot of reinforcement, a lot of attention. I've seen situations where the alienating parent got, and I, have, and I have situations where it was put on tape, got upset. We recently were in a case where the child was calling up, let's say, the father, and the father and, you know, was saying certain things, and the father lost it and was yelling at the kid, why did you call me up in the first place? Is that what you call up to tell me? Why did you say? It was all on tape. The judge read the transcripts. There was a change of custody. Um, factors impeding the success of programming and brainwashing. Um, I think I, re I worded that incorrectly. But there has to be abundant, well, no, it's correct. There has to be abundant positive contact with the target parent. A drop in the bucket gives the other parent, you know, six days and 21 hours to undo it. Amy Baker had a wonderful analogy. Somebody is a member of a cult. They go, they leave the cult, and they go to the parents' home. Remember, they've re They've written off all their belongings. They've given everything they own to the cult. They want to have nothing to do. So they have three hours or a weekend with the parent. Let me tell you something. It's not going to get undone. That you need to have significant time. An older sibling or someone the child respects who is not influenced by the alienator is also helpful. External confirmation that the target parent is a good person the child is only alienated by one person. If you have the extended family jumping in, that doesn't help. The target parent is not defensive, but deals openly. So that's they express it. Well, tell me in what way. They deal with it openly so the kid doesn't feel that the parents are trying to hide something. And again, the child, depending on the child's cognitive development, they're able to recognize the programming and you know, um, brainwashing behaviors. And this one is absolutely key. The presence of legal and mental health professionals who are well-versed in the manifestations of alienation and not, not just know the definition of what alienation is. It is extremely com complicated. It is extremely stressful. It is not easy. It really requires a lot of blood, sweat, and tears uh, at certain points, depending on the situation. Again, it should be, I, I said the same professional should be there. And limiting the amount or ensuring supervised access between the child and the alienating parent, I believe, is imperative. Okay, and that's about it. Thank you. I'm well within my time. I think you all need that.